Good morning. Welcome. It is a privilege again to worship with you this morning and the study of God's Word. And I'm grateful for uh, Mark and the elders um, to, to pull me out of the chair and, and here before you. Um, our time this morning, I, I, may the Lord bless it uh, as we approach um, the Lord's Supper and strengthen our hearts in the Lord and point our minds to Christ um, as, we, as we proceed this morning. That's the pinnacle of our meeting, the meeting of the church where we remember the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ with the elements set before us. This morning we'll be looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 40. It's a marvelous text, uh, especially for the weary of heart, um, the heavy laden, the burden of the world that comes, those who are weary and burdened uh, under trial, the circumstances of life. Uh, chapter 40 directs us to the comfort and strength of Almighty God. That's what I've titled uh, our message this morning. Our, our text is a bit longer than usual, uh, so I'm going to try something a little different. I'll uh, go through the text uh, verse by verse and then make a comment as we proceed uh, and then close uh, in, in prayer. Um, before going into chapter 40, uh, it's a pivotal point in, in Isaiah. It, it's the second part to Isaiah. Uh, it's important to note a few things about the book of Isaiah and how the chapter fits into the book itself. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but now I will. Uh, modern scholars um, started in the late 18th century, the late 1700s, uh, began to say, you know, Isaiah was not written by one prophet. Isaiah, it had to be two. They would call it Deutero-Isaiah. And here this is where we begin in, in Deutero-Isaiah. And the reason for that is because the prophecies found within Isaiah are so crisp and clear. Um, they would, it, it, there's, no, or, there's no other explanation than to say this is a miraculous prophecy, the miraculous word of God given forth years before these events occurred. And, and the lost uh, scholar, uh, they're not biblical scholars, for they're not biblical, uh, but they would deny the, the authenticity of that power of the word. Um, so crisp and clear are Isaiah's um, uh, prophecies. In the, late 18th, uh, in the late 19th century, so the late 1800s, another scholar would come and say, no, there's a trito Isaiah. There's actually three, and then there's four. Well, the early church and uh, Israel, the church has upheld and the scriptures itself in Matthew and Mark uphold that the latter texts of Isaiah are indeed written by the single prophet of Isaiah. It is the word of God. So a few things to note about how this chapter fits into the book and the book itself. Isaiah is ministering during a time of a divided kingdom. The kingdom is split, rebellious Israel to the north. Uh, the southern border cut off from Jerusalem, just north of Jerusalem. Um, and, Judea, and Judah to the south, the northern capital of, 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 of Jerusalem. Isaiah ministered in that southern kingdom, primarily in uh, Jerusalem, uh, in and around Jerusalem itself. Isaiah ministered during the reigns of four kings, uh, King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Zechariah, or I'm sorry, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. The Syrians were the military powerhouse during that time. Uh, this was about 100 years or so before the, uh, the, uh, the exile into Babylon. Uh, and it was some 700 years or so before uh, the first advent and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 170 years or so, uh, Cyrus the king would, 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 would uh, take over Babylon and that Persian king would then send Israel back according to the, the prophecy and fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah. Someone told me that studying Isaiah uh, is like looking at a map on an overhead projector that has several plastic sleeves overlapping one another, um, displaying different 
frames of time in history, um, each layer depicting a different age. Um, Isaiah, rather than looking back as a map of history would look back, Isaiah is looking forward in that map of history to come uh, in prophecy of forward. The immediate layer of Isaiah's prophecies were of that given day uh, uh, pertaining to the judgment of God um, in the hands of the Assyrians. Uh, the Assyrians would be used as a rod for God's judgment. The capital of the northern kingdom, uh, Israel, uh, was Samaria, and they would be conquered, and many would be carried away uh, from the northern kingdom into captivity under the Assyrian um, oppression. Um, however, Isaiah prophesied that Israel, uh, that Judah would remain, and Jerusalem would remain intact, uh, delivered over in, by the hand of God in a miraculous way. The Assyrian king Sennacherib is written, uh, historians, uh, uh, I won't go into it, but Sennacherib wrote himself that he had uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, entrapped like a bird, like a caged bird, like a bird in the cage. Um, and indeed, they were surrounded, uh, but Isaiah would prophesy uh, that, uh, to, that, that not even an arrow would be fired. They would not touch the city. Their sieges would not uh, take place. Um, and, and so that occurred in uh, Babylon. Uh, and so there's that immediate layer of, of history there. Uh, Isaiah would point further uh, to the kingdom of Babylon in which the southern kingdom would fall and Jerusalem would be destroyed and conquered. The temple destroyed some 100 years or so later. Isaiah would point out further some 70 years after that to the reign of King Persia, or the king of Persia, Cyrus the Great. He would name him by name some 170 plus years before he was even born. So precise that uh, uh, Isaiah wrote in chapter 45 his name. Isaiah would prophesy still further to the servant of God, the Messiah who would come some 700 plus years later. And yet the, the plastic sheet continues on and the, he points to the second advent of the Messiah who would return first as a suffering servant and second return as a reigning king. Um, uh, establishing his kingdom and redeeming the people of Israel, God's chosen people. Uh, and more than that, he would be the suffering servant, would be the savior of the world. And he would gather his hen as a chick, as a hen would gather his chicks uh, in the culmination of his time. Salvation would come from the servant and there would be a full restoration of the kingdom. Dr. Johnson compared the first 66 chapters of Isaiah to the, to the 66 books of the Bible. And this is pretty fascinating. The first 39 chapters that precedes the chapter where we are on is likened that of the 39 books of the Old Testament, pointing to judgment, the law. The second 27 books, uh, the ch second 27 chapters of Isaiah Dr. Johnson likened it to the gospel of the New Testament, the books of the New Testament that point to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see the gospel provided. Chapters 1 and through 33, uh, 39 highlights the judgment of God. And chapters 40 through 66 highlights the redemption, the redeemer, the salvation that is found in the servant of the Lord. Chapter 39 concludes with that further, that future destruction and the plundering of Jerusalem under Babylon. King Hezekiah would openly boast of the riches before the king of Babylon in that, in, in that current age in which Hezekiah lived. He, he boasted that there was nothing. There was nothing I didn't show him. I showed him all the treasures um, of, of Jerusalem and all of Israel. He boasted. And the word of the Lord came to Hezekiah through the prophet of Isaiah. And all the treasures of Jerusalem in future time would be carried away, plundered, and the people removed. The, the, the temple destroyed. Nothing would be left. And there was a great pronouncement of judgment to come. 
It's the three verses in the previous, in the previous uh, chapter. Well, chapter 40 introduces part two of Isaiah. It's the prelude to the next 27 chapters. Um, the next 27 chapters are divided into three sections, nine chapters each. It's very even, um, evenly divided. Salvation would come to Israel again. In our chapter, in chapter 40, we can divide it simply into two sections. Verses 1 through 11, we see the comfort provided by an almighty God. The comfort provided by almighty God. From verses 12 through 31, we see strength provided by Almighty God. Strength and comfort. Salvation would come to Israel again. They would not be abandoned into the judgment of God, but will be delivered, and ultimately will be delivered through the person and work of the suffering servant, the Messiah to come. And his people would be comforted. His people would be strengthened. That's how it opens in verse 1. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Here reveals the great character and nature of the triune God towards his people. Chapter 39, just three verses of judgment pronounced. But very quickly, the spotlight shifts uh, to the hope of salvation to come, that comfort, the comfort of his people. The church in Corinth, in Corinth Paul would uh, write very hard things to, to, to hear as a church in the state in which the church in Corinth was. Um, there were many among the church who were in sin, and he opened his letter of 2 Corinthians with these words. He opens, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. The final discourse to his disciples, John, so that's God the Father, God of all comfort. In the final discourse to his disciples, Jesus would mention three times from chapter 14 through chapter 16 in the Gospel of John. Jesus would speak to the whole of the Holy Spirit as a great comforter, a helper to his people. Four times the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, a comforter for his people. One of the great characteristics of the anointed servant of the Lord in Isaiah is that he is sent to comfort those who mourn. This is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ sent to comfort the, all that mourn. Isaiah 61, chapter, two, uh, chapter 61, verse 2. In Matthew 4, 5, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus proclaims, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Indeed, those who mourn, who see themselves rightly before an almighty God and mourn over their sin in repentance and faith, they'll be comforted. They'll be comforted by the Lord Jesus Christ. The word comforter is the same word used for advocate, that paraclete. It, it's the same word, the advocate, comforter, helper. It's the same word. In 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Does that not wonderfully point to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our advocate? He is our advocate before God the Father first. And he is our great comforter. What delight that gives to the comfort of his people. And it meets us. It should meet us with great joy. <clears throat> in the midst of where we, where we are in this life. Um, 
Henry Ironside would say, does that, that point us wonderfully to the work of the Messiah? He is our advocate, our intercessor, our helper. Um, I'm sorry, he, he would say that this points to the unity in the triune God. Henry Ironside, uh, Harry Ironside would say, how blessed to be in the fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that one can enter into and enjoy the comfort they delight to give. Triune God delights to give comfort to his people. Indeed, the pain and anguish of God's people would, endu uh, would, would endure um, uh, as they were taken away into the Babylonian captivity. Uh, their their uh, anguish and pain would be great, but in it, the Lord would be working out his sovereign plan to bring his people to a place of repentance and to bring them comfort and restore them for his true people. And the word of God's people, uh, the word to God's people here is comfort. The kindness of God will appear. Behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face and it will be revealed in time. The Lord in his providence would take his people to a place where they would be shown their utter need and dependence upon him. Uh, there would be no fooling of themselves that they are self-reliant or dependent in and of their own strength. They would be put to the ground where they would, they would, the only place to turn would be to the Almighty God for his comfort and deliverance. Uh, and so too, for a moment, all discipline for us, for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God's plan and where we meet, uh, where, where we meet this morning in, in the circumstances of our life is designed and ordained by God to draw us to him, our great comfort. That's where God's people will ultimately be led to a place where her warfare has ended, continues, her iniquity will be removed, and she will receive the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And what a great encouragement this would be for his people who are enduring the dark valley of that exile into Babylon. Um, the Lord has taken them to a place where they would see utter and complete dependence upon the Lord for salvation. They would no, have no other place to turn. And through turning, and through the turning of his people uh, by faith, through faith and repentance, the Lord gives double in return for, this, for their sins. Not in a sense of double, double punishment. Um, if I hit my brother, he would hit me double, double as hard. It's not that way. Um, uh, not in the sense of double punishment, but a double restoration in a sense. For in the future plan of God at the fulfillment of the times, he will gather his people from all four corners of the world and restore his kingdom. And his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. His people will receive double for all their sins. His grace and mercy will be double that of their sin, so to speak. The picture here we see is that the account is settled in full. They will receive double. Um, the debt has been fully paid for his people. We sing of this periodically, do we not? What riches of kindness he has lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cross, was the cost. We stood neath a death, neath, neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. And so too his comfort. A voice calling would continue um, here and introduce the great herald, uh, a clear, uh, to clear the way for the servant of the Lord. A voice calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. 
for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah wrote this again some 700 years before uh, the first coming of Christ. And we see the fulfillment of this in John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter, 30, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, he is the herald, the, for the forerunner of the Messiah, pointing to Christ and, uh, and calling to clear the way, make way for the Messiah who has come. In John chapter 1, we see the glory of the Lord revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist would say, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And indeed, the Apostle John would write, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten, full of grace, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And here in Isaiah, we see the two plastic sheets on that projector uh, together uh, displayed. Uh, the first three, the fulfillment of the first coming of the Messiah. And verse 5 would be fulfilled at the second advent and his second return, when all flesh will see his glory together of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The countless many will bow their knee in the second return and confess by the grace of God, have already done so through faith and with joy and praise and eager anticipation, uh, await and receive the salvation to come. But there will also be a many who will bow the knee, whose tongue will confess under God's righteous wrath and judgment, for they have rejected him in his life. All flesh will see his glory. There will be two Israels. There will be the true Israel who are the sheep of his fold. And there will be many like us, a great many, Gentile grafted in um, to that fold, to that, that uh, flock of, of a different fold. There will be a, 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 the unbeliever, those who reject the Messiah, uh, Israel on the surface, but not true Israel in the heart. They will, be they will behold his glory nonetheless, not in the way of salvation, but in the way of condemnation and judgment. Um, and they will be cast out. And now the glory of the Lord is juxtaposed to the glory of man. Uh, the glory of man is then juxtaposed to the eternal word of God. In verse six, a voice calls, a voice says, call out, cry out, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is like grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of the God stands forever. The word of God is a great revealer. It reveals the very character and nature of Almighty God in his special revelation. It points to who God is, but also it rips off the blinders of who we are before him. And who man is, all, fle all flesh is but grass. That's you and I. There is no deceit in God's word. We are but grass. And all its loveliness, all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. How quickly we wither and fade. I'm, I'm a withering man looking to a withering audience. I got a haircut yesterday and realized how quickly I'm withering. Uh, uh. Now the word of God, though, that is how true it is and how right it is for us to see ourselves in light of who we truly are. That is grace. The strongest of men are but grass. The strength of man is of nothing. Before God's people are to be comforted, they must be brought to a place of that realization of who they are before an almighty God, lost in the wilderness of sin with no ability to stand 
in and of ourselves. That's who we are. And we wither and fade, just as the grass in the wilderness withers and fades. It's a direct result of our sin before a righteous and eternal God. The wages of sin is death. This is the fallen man, uh, fallen human race without exception. Without exception, we must be brought to this reality. The reality of our utter hopelessness, helplessness, inability, and only then are our hearts uh, turned Godward by the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit to look to Him for comfort and salvation. And there it is fully realized. The Word of God stands forever. It is true. It is reliable. It doesn't change. We do. The Word doesn't. And by God's grace, He changes us uh, through His Holy Spirit. For what need does a lost man have for comfort if they do not first mourn over the realization of their lost state? One must first be brought to that realization before the gospel becomes good news. And good news it is. That realization is provided as a gift of God. Uh, only then are we enabled to hear and respond to God's eternal word. And that word becomes good to us. The gospel of good news. And the word endures forever. Verse 9, get up, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Jerusalem, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might and his arm ruling from him, uh, and his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. From chapter, from verses 9 through 11, Zion is told, Jerusalem, uh, Zion is told uh, to announce the Lord's coming, both as ruler and as shepherd. Here is your God. Behold your God. Again, the sheets are together. In the first advent, the Messiah has come. He is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd of his people. In his first coming, he, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He calls them by name. And the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. Both the true sheep among, the true, among true Israel and his sheep who are grafted in again into that fold, the Gentile, us. And like a shepherd gathers his lamb, so too the Lord gathers his own. He will lead them gently. Um, and again, the good shepherd will return. And he will return and reign. And he will come with the strength, with great strength. And with great strength, he will uphold his people. We see that in verses 12 through 64. Um, the latter half of this, this great, I'm sorry, chapters, uh, uh, gosh, chapter 12, uh, verse 12 through 30, 31. Uh, the great strength of Almighty God. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighted the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or, has, as, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Consider that for a moment. The waters of the earth are but a drip, but a sip, um, and he holds them in the hollow of his hand. In the hollow of his hand, all the oceans of the world are pictured and held uh, by Almighty God. Behold your God, who holds the oceans 
in the palm of his hand, in the hollow of his hand. He measures the heavens, the galaxies of the universe, the entire universe, by a span of his hand, which is from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the pinky, the span of your hand. Jim Fraser's hand may, may have a larger span than mine, but it's measured. God measures his, the span of the entire universe, countless galaxies, by the, by the inch, by the inches, and we can't even see the end of it, or even count the number of galaxies, much less the number of stars, and yet sovereign God has named each one. Not only that, uh, but behold your God. The entire universe is measured by the inch, and yet he has calculated the dust uh, by measure, the mountains in balance. He is sovereign over creation. He is all-knowing and all-wise. Behold, your God. We sing of that, do we not? Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his word? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. That is where we are directed in our text. And does it not point to the supremacy of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, so well? This is the Lord's servant of Israel, the image of the invisible God in his person. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And in him all things hold together. Every atom of the galaxy is upheld by the sovereign hand of the servant who had come and the reigning king who is yet to come. And this is the strength and might of the Lord. The might of, of his, the strength of his might is sovereign. Sovereign over all creation. And not only that, he is sovereign over all the affairs of, the, of his creation, of mankind. Verse 15, behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket, from a bucket. Just a drop in a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. That's the strength of men before the strength of their creator. And now Isaiah addresses the utter foolishness of Israel uh, to turn away and turn aside to the idols of things uh, created by the creature uh, in worship in light of the previous texts of God's omniscience and omnipotence. Uh, Isaiah takes a fitting tone, almost a mocking tone towards Israel. And the north had long turned to idols and it would be a thorn in the side of Israel, the idols of the nations, even in the Babylonian captivity. And we see there the elect of God in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would not bow the knee and serve an idol, but would serve alone Almighty God. Here we see verse 18, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who, too, he who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Here in the West, we don't deal with these sorts of idols. Uh, when I lived in Japan, it was a daily a daily thing that I encountered. Um, idols, shrines on almost every street. 
In the home of, of a common Japanese citizen, there's a shrine uh, of an idol, idol worship. I befriended, um, uh, 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 I befriended a, a World War II veteran uh, for a few years, he would come to my home, every, my apartment, my small apartment, every Monday. Uh, he would, we would, we had a trade-off. Um, he wanted me to, he wanted to study English. His English was very good, and I couldn't really teach him anything, but uh, he, he was so proficient. But he would bring over uh, the Wall Street Journal, and we would look through an article. And in trade, he would teach me about uh, Japan before the war, during the war, and after the war. Masa-san was one of the most fascinating men I, I met. Um, one day he said, hey, I want to take you to, to a shrine. Um, this was a very uh, historical shrine in Japan. Uh, it was established by a man who would be considered like a, a unifier of Japan. Uh, Japan was at war between uh, the Shinto and the Buddhists, and this, this man, this great samurai, would bring, bring the people together. Um, unifying those two um, idolatrous um, cults. Um, but he wanted me to take me to, to a shrine. So I went with him, and he showed me. Uh, we went in, and the shrine was more like a museum. Behind the window pane of glass was uh, idol after idol uh, carved out in an image of wood. And he would tell me, this is the name of this god, and he does this, and this is this God, and he does that. Well, at the end of the day, it was an all-day affair, and at the end of the day, there was a, a park, and we were enjoying some tea at the sunset. The sun was setting behind the mountains, and he asked me something to the effect of, what, what was most impressive about your day? What was the thing that, that, was, uh, that, that most impressed you? Um, and I began to sh talk to him about the idols that we had just seen. They were carved out of wood. What happened to the other part of that tree in which the carvings fell? Um, were they not set aside and burned? Um, and what of these idols? Uh, they have eyes, but can they see? They have mouths, can they speak? They have hands, but can they move? Can they move any direction to help you, much less themselves? How much more or less? Can they help, help and save any who follow after them? <clears throat> and uh, the sun was setting brilliantly, and I said, this, this is the, <clears throat> the highlight of our time together. <clears throat> Look to the sun, the beauty of the colors of the sky, maker of the heavens and the earth. He is sovereign over it all, and he is created and revealed in nature his glory and power. How dare we look to a block of wood for any help when we have the great creator who is our helper. Um, <clears throat> there was a story I reminded him of a priest who served for generations in a shrine. Uh, his temple, the shrine, uh, caught fire. The priest ran into the burning shrine and he opened up where the little idol was held and he, he brought it out of the fire. That act in itself pointed him as the scriptures point and it made him think and ponder. In the time of fire, the idol could not help itself. I had to rescue it. What power does it have to rescue me? And there he was set on a path to look, and he found the answers in the eternal word of God that pointed to the power of Almighty God. And the Lord found him and saved him. Um, how can we diminish the greatness of God to a block of wood? Well, he would continue, verse 21, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. We see that, do we not, in the skies, in the, in the sunset, in the Texas stars, 
that he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. He spreads them out like a tent. But we have a problem. John Calvin points to the problem. He says the heart of man is a perpetual idol factory. If not a physical idol uh, formed out of material, the heart of man will create another idol. Will he not? We don't see idols like Japan sees, like we see in Japan, or as Israel saw in their time. But here in the West, we have many other idols, do we not? We talk about uh, knowledge is power, right? Really? We talk about the mighty dollar, is it? Um, we look to the strength of our own might, how prone we are. In the West, natural man, we form many idols. The heart of men is a perpetual idol factory. And Isaiah points to this. He exposes this in the continuing verses. Verse 23, the strength of one's own might, the idol of self, success, wealth, power, is exposed for what it is. Verse 23, he it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they planted, scarcely have they sown, scarcely has their livestock, have their stock been taken root in the ground, in the earth. But he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. All the greatest works of men, of the work of man's hands, are, is as of nothing. All the riches are of nothing. Scarcity, they all come up in short supply. They fall infinitely short in comparison to the great storehouses of our God. Verse 25, to whom will you then liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars? The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Consider the strength of our Lord. Israel's access to the strength of his might. And consider our access to the strength of his might. And that strength of his might is our strength. The Lord is our strength. And how abundant that is in supply. Not in scarcity, but in abundance. One of my favorite memories in Japan, going to church uh, one, one morning, there was an elderly, a new, new believer, member of the church, and there he brought his shrine uh, to the parking lot. And he had a hammer and he was, he was bashing that shrine. And it was funny because there were children who were almost making a game of it as well. And the little small children had their own hammers and they were helping him bash the shrine. That is the power of God to break the idol of our hearts. And consider the strength of our Lord who conquers all. Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes? And notice, my God, do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait upon the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weary. And so we look to him. We look to him. God Almighty, our Creator, sovereign over all things, who is a God of all comfort, who is a God of all strength. And He gives comfort and strength lavishly, lavishes His comfort and strength 
upon all who look to him and trust in him in full. He rejects none who do, who come to him, who look to him. And may, may we do so this morning. And as we continue in the services, may we set our mind on the great comforter found in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts and strengthens all who turn to him. If you know not Christ, look to him. That is the, the plea of the message of Isaiah. Look to Christ, the God of all comfort and the God of all strength, and be saved. And to his people who are, that's the message of Isaiah, the good news. He comforts the weary. Those who mourn will be comforted. And those who are weak will be strengthened in the strength of his might. May God bless the reading of his word and our study this morning as we go out from here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, our God of all comfort and strength. What a blessing it is to be found and declared uh, uh, righteous by the person and work of your Son, clothed in his righteousness, not of ourselves, but it is a foreign righteousness imputed to us. For our sin has been imputed and swallowed up in victory at the cross, buried in the grave. And we worship a risen Lord who will, who is ascended and seated at your right hand and who will return, who will come in his imminent timing, in your imminent timing. May we look to him, lift up our hearts and strengthen our hearts. For we do grow weary and, and tired and troubled. For this world, there is many trouble, but you have overcome the world and your son. May we look to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.